with the plethora of unnecessary sequels that Disney has cranked out over the years, it seems like a no-brainer that there would be a follow-up to The Lion King. However, this one is actually not bad. It's nowhere near as good as its predecessor, but there is a great deal of genuine effort put into this sequel that actually makes it a commendable continuation of the story. Whereas the first film was loosely based on Shakespeare's Hamlet, this one continues that tradition by taking an approach similar to Romeo and Juliet. With Simba having taken his place as King of Pride Rock, he must now deal with the pressure of actually ruling the kingdom. Aiming to eventually take over the Pride Lands are the Outsiders, a group of lions who are banished for remaining loyal to Scar. Leading these dangerous rogues is Zira, a murderous lioness who was Scar's most devoted follower. On top of trying to prevent a hostile takeover, Simba must also deal with his rambunctious daughter Kiara, whose free spirit and curiosity lead her to meet and subsequently fall in love with Zira's son, Kovu. As you would expect, given the Shakespearean scenario, these two sides inevitably come into conflict, as the star-crossed lovers are caught right in the middle. One advantage that this film has over many other Disney sequels is the fact that almost the entire original cast returns to reprise their respective roles. Matthew Broderick does a good job with voicing a more experienced, while nevertheless flawed version of Simba, which is interesting given how we never actually saw him deal with being the king in the first film. Seeing him conflicted about what action he should take while trying to live up to his father's high standard is a good way to keep the audience invested, despite the fact that he doesn't go through quite as much of a journey here. Moira Kelly has a distinctly more motherly vibe as Nala, which is appropriate, but doesn't really leave her with quite as much dramatic material to work with. Nathan Lane and Ernie Sabella are a little overused and are not written quite as well, but they still work well off of each other and never really become too grating. Robert Guillaume is still charmingly crazy as Rafiki, maintaining that balance of unpredictability and wisdom. Even James Earl Jones comes back for about two lines during a pretty intense dream sequence, but he sells those two lines. Probably the most glaring omission is Rowan Atkinson as Zazu, but Edward Hebert gets the job done even though they sound nothing alike. Among the new players are Nev Campbell as Kiara and Jason Marston as Kovu, who each do very well at making their characters feel conflicted and rebellious, yet somehow endearing. The fact that they actually spend time on the characters instead of just jumping right into the love story makes it all the more credible due to their believable interactions. Andy Dick as Zira's eldest son, Nuka, is one area that's lacking. I'm not going to say that Andy Dick playing a lanky, loud, obnoxious, termite-infested character is ideal casting, mainly because it goes without saying. On the other end of the spectrum, the best addition to the cast has to be Suzanne Plachette as Zira, who I honestly believe is one of the great Disney foes. She is just so intense and frightening, clearly giving it her all and having a good time making for a truly memorable villainess with a pretty sharp design. As you'd probably guess, the story takes a few liberties with the Romeo and Juliet story, but I actually think the changes made are for the better. I already mentioned how they take a great deal of time with the love story, but Kovu's mission in the movie is a brilliant addition to the story in my book. Not only does it make sense from a strategic point of view, but it provides some decent dramatic tension even though it is slightly predictable. Seeing him conflict with being Scar's heir, much like Simba being Mufasa's heir, makes for an interesting identity crisis, although the story itself, its emotional punch, and its use of the characters are not quite as strong this time around. Many of the film's supporting players, like Nala, are much more peripheral this time around. They don't really have as much of a purpose as they did before. This is most apparent with Timon and Pumbaa. In the first film, they had a narrative reason to be there. Here, their inclusion feels somewhat obligatory. They frequently wander into frame for occasional sketches, less for story purposes and more because, hey, they were in the first film. On a more minor note, there are a few details that you just have to accept, namely the omission of Sarabi. The original intention was to have Madge Sinclair reprise her role, but her death in 1995 caused them to write her out of the movie. Another minor nitpick has to do with Simba's child, whose gender poses a bit of a continuity error. So, 
what uninspired songs will they get some talentless pop star to phone in for this film? Wait a minute. That's one of the songs from the Broadway show. And it's sung here by Lebo M, the African singer who did the from the first film. That's actually a really clever callback that makes for a pretty good opening. Okay, to be more objective, while this song is fantastic, none of the other selections in the film can quite match it. We Are One is nice and hopeful in conveying the theme of the film. My Lullaby is predictably foreboding, although it is very reminiscent of Be Prepared. Upendi is charming and whimsical, even given the distractingly cartoonish color scheme taken straight from I Just Can't Wait to Be King. Not one of us comes the closest to matching the quality of the opening, managing to feel both epic and sorrowful. However, Love Will Find a Way is a little too cheesy for my taste. These songs are not bad, but they're just not as catchy as those of the first film. The same can be said for the animation. Granted, it's a great deal superior to many other Disney sequels, but it just can't help feeling like a major downgrade from its predecessors. The musical score, while still distinctly African in style and fairly memorable, is not as majestic as the originals. A lot of these issues can likely be attributed to the film's format and budgetary limitations, but some of them come down to just simply not being as well written. In that sense, I think it was the best option to release it on video. The film's biggest problem is that it's a sequel to The Lion King, but that should not deter people from seeing it, as it still boasts a solid story, appealing characters, accomplished animation, all things considered, pretty decent music, and its own charm. Ooh, 